fun. I know. I'm getting too <laughs> old for that stuff. I can't do it like I used to. <laughs> Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping, you know that, Nomi. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got yeah. the vape. Always yeah. got the vape. That's what I thought. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. A question from our chat, Rick. Very important question. Uh, they want to know, several people want to know, is there THC? Oh, no, it's in Randy's vape. I thought it was in Rick's vape. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. I've got the vape. Rick's got the vape. Always yeah. got the vape. That's what I thought. Is there yeah. THC in that? Oh, no. You know something? <laughs> Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I never put it down. I always get that question. No, there's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's no fun. That's no fun. I know. I'm getting too <laughs> old for that stuff. I can't do it like I used to. Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping, you know that, Nomi. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. Always yeah. got the vape. That's what I thought. Always yeah. got the vape. That's what I thought. A, a question from our chat, Rick. Very important question. Uh, they want to know, several people want to know, is there THC? Oh, no, it's in Randy's vape. I thought it was in Rick's vape. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. I've got the vape. Rick's got the vape. Yeah. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. Is there yeah. THC in that? Oh, no. You know something? <laughs> Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I never put it down. I always get that question. No, there's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's no fun. That's no fun. I know. <laughs> always vaping oh I, th that was the most amazing montage are we making rick rick unger like a millennial celebrity now with his his vaping montage dorsey great work uh welcome to the nomi key show i am nomi key const this is day four of the trumpster fire convention the final day of any convention is always a big day an incumbent president makes his case for re-election but like everything with Donald Trump, this day is becoming something huge, as you would say, the biggest day ever. Well, okay, not just that. Maybe it's just a big effing deal, as Joe Biden would say. This could be the moment that decides this election. For real, stick with me on this. Can Republicans distract the country from the pandemic and the unfolding economic tragedy? Can Democrats find a clear voice to say that they are the party of long overdue racial justice while drawing a line against violence that's in the streets, perpetuated by you-know-who. So stay close. So many crucial questions are colliding. A black man was shot seven times in the back. Say his name, Jacob Blake. In all places, Kenosha. A swing city in a swing state of Wisconsin. Anger is boiling over. Some small businesses are burned. A white teenager shows up with a rifle a racist white extremist who joins a vigilante group and ends up shooting two men to death, one who is trying to save the other man. Republicans instantly grabbed hold of this mess to say it proved their narrative that Democrats bring disorder. Only reelecting Donald Trump will stop it. That was their message. Yeah, he's doing a great job of that. So here is Mike Pence last night making that case. Dorsey, can we roll that Mike Pence clip? So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. Joe Biden, though, he walked a different line uh, in this video that he put out on social media. Uh, Dorsey, can we play that Joe Biden clip? You know, as I said after George Floyd's murder, protesting brutality is a right and absolutely necessary. But burning down communities is not protest. It's needless violence. Violence that endangers lives. Violence that guts businesses and shutters businesses that serve the community. That's wrong. In the midst of this pain, the wisest words that I've heard spoken so far have come from Julia Jackson, Jacob's mother. She looked at the damage done in her community and she said this, quote, this doesn't reflect my son or my family. So let's unite and heal, do justice, end the violence and end systemic racism in this country now. 
Still waiting for those solutions, Joe Biden. Still want to know, what do you mean by ending systemic racism? And I love how he, a Democrat, a neoliberal Democrat, is responding to the Republican narrative. Republicans want this to be the central subject of the election. Violence in the streets. Not what caused the violence in the streets. Not the white boys who are shooting innocent people down, who think that they're vigilante cops. Not the white supremacy that has been organized in police departments around the country. If Republicans succeed, they may may still have a shot at a narrow victory in Wisconsin and those other Rust Belt states that gave Trump his 2016 Electoral College win. But if Biden can turn the conversation back to the economy and the pandemic and real racial justice, he likely wins. So now you see why today is so important. Having heard from Pence and Biden, Donald Trump steps to a microphone in just a few hours. Trump has quite a complicated job tonight. Uh, he will ha- try to drive home the message of his convention that your children or, or frankly, grandchildren, because I think that's who's listening, won't be safe under a Biden administration. While at the same time, he's going to have to channel some kinder, gentler image his convention sought to create from, for him through his surrogates. I've been getting whiplash from this mixed message, and I'm not really sure Donald Trump can pull it off tonight. Maybe he just needs to pull off enough. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't find Donald Trump particularly good with nuance and subtlety uh, and really holding and biting his tongue. But I'm sure it's just me. But of course, we in the movement are a prop for him, not a target of his voter appeals. His target audience is wavering voters in places like Kenosha, wavering white voters. And his target against us is to keep us from going to the polls. So buckle up. 68 days until polls close. We have an excellent show for you today. Who better to help us think through this moment in history than the historically minded and forward thinking as well, Thomas Frank. Then later we have a panel with Morgan Pachma, who directed and produced Get Me Roger Stone out on Netflix, and former chief of staff and deputy campaign manager to Senator Bernie Sanders, among many other roles he's had, Ari Ravenhoft. But first, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe. Click on the bell that gets your alerts, uh, gets you alerts of our lives. We are going uh, three to four p.m. tomorrow, our last day to cover the 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 <laughs> cover the future of the movement, but really to look back on the week of the convention, um, the RNC and the DNC. So you make sure to click that like and subscribe button, that alert, so you know we are going live at three p.m. Eastern. Uh, This week, we are about to dump a bunch of coverage out on Patreon, coverage you will not get on the YouTube show. So join us at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show for as low as $5 a month. And if you give a little bit more, we have mugs, we have stickers, we have bags, lots of swag at thenomikeyshow.com. We'll be back in a couple of seconds with Thomas Frank. Civi is an app that helps you find the politicians that best align with your beliefs. Whether quarantining at home alone or with family, it's as if it were the holidays. Gone are the days of no politics at the dinner table. We talk about our positions and express our support of politicians that we believe support our ideals. But in truth, how can we be sure that they actually do? There is a lot of noise out there. And recently, it feels like our assumptions about the world are being challenged every day. Civi is an app here to help you navigate the world of information around you, to help you better grow, develop, and understand your political leanings and where you fit in today's political landscape. Their algorithm fills the content based on your stances, shows you leaders who actually match your values, and independent media to help keep you informed. The more you use it, the better it grows. Find Civi on iTunes today. The question from our chat, Rick, very important question. Uh, They want to... Welcome back to the no vape. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. I've got the vape. Rick's got the vape. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. Is there yeah. THC in that? Oh, no. You know something? <laughs> Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I never put it down. I always get that question. No, there's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's, no fun. That's no fun. I know. I'm getting too <laughs> old for that stuff. I can't do it like I used to. Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping, you know that, Nomi. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. Always got the vape. That's what I thought.
Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I got this new remote thing, and it's uh, it's just adding so much complication to my life. Can we just be done with COVID so we can have a studio again? Man, uh, I'm excited to have back the one and only Thomas Frank. He is the author of The People Know, A Brief History of Antipopulism. He is also the author of Listen Liberal or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People. Lots of people here. And What's the Matter with Kansas? Thomas Frank, it is a joy to have you back on. I felt like we were cut so short last week, so now we can rip on the Republicans this week. How you doing? <laughs> no, me. I'm great. Yourself? I, you know, I pulled it up here. I'm alive and I'm healthy. So that's you know, that's, that's about all, all one can ask in this day and age. Am I right? <laughs> exactly. Um, OK, so this this week has been like very entertaining. I, I, will, I will say uh, very little learned, but um, entertaining. Uh, the, the RNC really stepped up their their cultish game. I should say the Trump RNC. The Trump cult. The Trump cult, yeah. Uh, I guess just from the get-go, like what what big takeaways have you uh, taken from this convention? Well, first, let, when, when did we talk last? Had the Democrats done their done their act yeah. yet? Yeah, they had done. We were in the midst of the Democrats doing. Yeah, that. It, so I, it, you know, I came away from that learning three things: that the Democrats are the party of diversity, that um, the Joe Biden. <laughs> I almost forgot his name. Joe Biden's a really, really nice wants, guy. Actually. I know <laughs> he's a really, really nice guy, and everybody likes him. And uh, third of all, that Trump is a unique danger to uh, uh, you know to our political tradition. And I think all three of those things are true, but I don't think that's really um, enough. You know what I mean? And um, and uh, I, you know, as soon as I saw that, as soon as I, I, I sort of started to say to myself, "Where's the issues that?" people like me and well, all of my sort of dumb liberal friends have been talking about for the last 20 years, right? Where's our issues? Where's inequality? Where's healthcare? Where's, you know, the middle class? Do you remember the middle unions? class? Where are the yeah. union leaders? Where's the Not unions? one exactly. union leader. No nurse, no nurses, no flight attendants, uh, no postal workers. The, the yep. nerve they had mentioning the post office without having Mark yep. Dimenstein on from the postal workers. <laughs> yeah. So there, you noticed it too. So I was watching, I'm like, what What the hell happened? It's as though those things have been completely forgotten or are not important anymore. And uh, and so I said, as soon as I, I figured this out, I'm like, well, Trump's not going to let that stuff. He, that's just, all that does is when you don't mention it, all it does is it opens a lane for this guy. The very first speaker and the very first night of the Republican convention is like, we're all about the middle class. Of course they did it. Right. And, and they're going to continue. They're going to, I think uh, you saw Biden got no bounce from his convention, well, which is, I mean, to be fair, it's not a major primetime spectacle anymore. It's not a huge news event. The you know the reporters of America aren't in an auditorium somewhere talking with each other and writing. You remember what these things used to be yeah. like? It was a huge deal. So right, you, you know, lower expectations. But I think that uh, the Republican convention. I hate to say this. I think it's. Um, I think it's effective so far because they have this incredibly low bar that they have to get over, which is like, you know, Donald Trump is a reptile and they're like, they have to, they have to show that he's not. They have to show, it's like, no, he's a regular, he's a human. Yeah. And if they can do that, if they can do that, they're going to, uh, they're going to have a successful convention. <laughs> you know, he has been, um, he has been depicted as the lowest kind of monster for four years running. And if they are just, you know, barely able to push back against that, it'll be a success. And I, I have a question for you. And, and, and I'm just, the only thing I can think of that, that somewhat relates to this, although it's not a perfect uh, analogy is I feel like Joe Biden is the Joe, John McCain of our party. Like when the RNC put so little into John McCain and obviously used Sarah Palin as, as a prop. I, actually, I think there might be some similarities in t terms of dynamic. Well, they are. Uh, they were best friends, right? Weren't they? I mean, they this were was... best friends on the campaign trail or oh, Joe Biden and Biden and, and uh, McCain. McCain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they ran against each other, but they were they were buddies. I mean, they are they are the two guys are the sort of personification of sort of uh, DC insider culture. Yeah, John you McCain know, endorsed him from the grave, of course. And they're, they've been senators. They were senators together forever. You know, they were pals. They're both guys are widely beloved here in the Beltway, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that sort of thing. Everybody loves Biden, by the way. 
in, here in D are you in dc no i'm in new york but okay I'm, but here, here in dc everybody you talk to i've never met him but uh everybody i uh, i you know talk to has met him or has a member a family member that met him and they all just think he's the most wonderful guy in the world They're and uh, the beltway because that's you yeah know, he's that's great. who he is yep they're doing great here's my prediction know me and i'm you can't move me from it they're gonna win the district of columbia the d's the d's are gonna win the district of columbia no doubt and, and the suburbs Virginia. and the exactly. suburbs yes that's right and maryland <laughs> i'm shocked i'm so shocked by it the, the, the lobbyist industrial complexes thinks that joe biden is more decent than the republican lobbyist industrial complex i so Last time we talked, we, we, we started to touch on, like, the Koch brothers. And it, it, I think what's really fascinating about this this RNC is how removed the more, like, traditional Republicans. And the Koch brothers, by no means, I don't think they're, like, necessarily the most traditional Republicans either. But it, this is Trump's party now. Yeah. And is there a coalition to help him win? Or, I mean, where, where do you see this going? Given well, you how saw that story. I think it was in the Washington Post today about... Uh, all of these Republicans from uh, from Romney, from McCain, and from George W. Bush's campaigns are all endorsing uh, uh, endorsing Biden. I mean, there's just a, a massive movement of Republican operatives from one party to the other, which is really quite interesting. I had a kind of a joke that I was working. Uh, uh, I was going to write it as an article. I didn't do it. Tease it out here, please. Let's okay. Do it. <laughs> I kind of dropped the ball on it, but it's, it, you know, I'm from Kansas. I spent a lot of the summer in Kansas City and uh, uh, the, the Republican Party in Kansas is the dominant one. And the Democrats are a tiny little sort of uh, a rump, you know, relic. They're just they're they, they they don't even contest all the statewide elections. That's how you know weak they are in Kansas. They do manage to elect a governor every now and then. But other than that quite weak. Anyhow, the, uh, they, they, they're running someone for the U.S. Senate now. I'm blanking on her name is Barbara Ballier, and she's a former Republican. She of switched course. parties like two years ago. And so my, my joke was going to be that, the, that the, uh, the Democratic Party in Kansas was a faction of the Republican Party, you know, the modern. And, but it's like, God damn it, that's, that's, it what, that's what yeah. we're becoming nationally, you know, yeah. a faction of the Republican Party. And of course, I mean, some of these states are were competitive. They were even competitive in the in the in the in the Clinton Gore years. I mean, I was looking at Tennessee because there's this amazing upset that happened a few weeks ago with uh, the Senate seat in Tennessee, where the DSCC, the Democratic uh, Senate Campaign Committee, mm -hmm. put their money behind a white man who raised millions of dollars, and turns out a woman named Marquita Bradshaw. Uh, won that primary with like nine thousand dollars. It was amazing. It was <laughs> I love I love stories like that. Incredible. That's, but isn't it funny how they they uh, they think that this game can go on forever? Yeah. You know they they have no intention. The the sort of hierarchy of the party, the uh, the, the 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 brass, the officers of the party have no intention of ever changing course. They're going to have to be. You know, it, they're just going to have to be beaten, uh, you know, in uh, however, you know, however these these things are done. It's going to be a long, long, difficult slog. Anyhow, I don't really want to talk about that, Naomi, because that's that's like. You want to talk about the fight moving forward? Let's just talk about the insanity of the Republicans. Yeah, let's talk about how, how crazy they are because it's so fun. Republicans are so much fun. They used to be fun because their, their conventions were so lavish. Remember we were talking about this? The I lobsters. think we left off. Well, I was at the 04 convention in New York City and I went to a party in the, in the uh, New York Yacht Club. The Republicans yeah. had a party in the, oh my God. And, uh, you know, it was just absolutely um, spectacular. And they used to do stuff like that. It's funny now, though, that the money is also migrating to the Democrats. You saw Hillary outspent uh, Trump two to one, outspent the billionaire two to one. And I'm sure you'll see something like that happening again this year. Well, I mean, if, if you're good for business, you save your money and you do, you use it effectively. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm clearly kidding, but yeah, I was wondering your, where you were your going face with that. just is like, what? No, but Donald, Donald Trump, I mean, there, there is a lot of, obviously, a lot of money in, in campaigns. And this campaign is really strange to me because there's really not a lot of money to spend on things that are outside of media. Uh, we don't know yeah. if, if the right. mail's going to even work. So, you know, presidential campaign, maybe there's mail, maybe there's not. I don't think so. But but other you know, races, yes. But it's it's really going to be ads. It's really going to be putting on these media productions. But even then, they're not even doing anything. So I'd like yeah. to know where the billion dollars is being spent, where it's going, and who's who, which. Oh, contracts. you're asking you're asking the wrong person. I'm no, sure I'm, it's I'm all being spent to some like uh, you know 
uh, uh, you know, computer farm in, uh, in yeah. what, you know, name your foreign country. <laughs> I have data. no idea. No, I mean, but it's crazy because um, Hillary made the mistake of not opening up offices in Wisconsin in particular, mm -hmm. um, but really investing in key areas of the Rust Belt and choosing other places in exchange. Not that they necessarily didn't have the money to do yeah, both. But yeah, and it turned out it was all about Trump's message, which you exactly. know, it still it still astonishes me to this day because she had all the professionals on her side. She had the you know the, the guys from Google, you know, all that crap, and it, and in the end, succeeded in losing. Yeah, <laughs> managed the, to the lose. The robots is, couldn't tell you how to save but, humanity. But here's what is fast. So uh, is it all going to happen again? So all of my friends are scared to death. You know, they see this sort of lackluster Democratic uh, convention, although technically excellent, and it had its moments, as they always do. I thought Michelle Obama was quite good. Mm -hmm. I thought Professor Obama was very professorial, <laughs> you know, and, and and Biden himself was 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 uh, was pretty good, too. I mean, they, they, it's not that they did a bad job. It's that they don't have they didn't have a positive, you know, anything to inspire people who aren't who don't already know the Beltway script, who don't yeah. read The Washington Post every day and The New York Times every day and understand what a momentous threat Donald Trump is to the world. And what, you know, what really intrigues me, Naomi, is that there is this way in which the broader feeling or the broader ideas of a campaign spill over into both sides and both sides are using them, even though, you know, like in this case, Republicans have no right to, but they're also saying, you know, this is a, an incredibly important election. This is the most important election of our lifetimes. If we lose this one, freedom will be, you know, in the past tense and future generations will wonder what this thing freedom was all about, you know, and, and it's like there, there, there is this feeling in the air that we're in a moment of crisis and both sides are, uh, and, and that feeling is of course ginned up by the, you know, liberal um, news media, but that doesn't mean that conservatives can't also make their play for the same emotion. Isn't that a peculiar thing? And you see that happening in all sorts of different ways uh, over the years. I'm trying to think of other examples, but I, I used to write about this all the time, but I've written about so many things I I can't remember them all anymore. I'm also well, so old now. I need to retire, Naomi. That's no, don't do it right now. Please don't. Please. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got all these books to read. <laughs> oh, you haven't read. Okay. No, um, I'm just kidding. I have read all of these. I can uh, all of them. <laughs> no, 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 no. But here's one I did write. The Wrecking Crew. Do you remember this one? Yeah, so this totally is about it was about it was about the Bush administration right. and and the Reagan administration and what they had in common and how they ran the government. And I you see all these pages that I've marked. I keep meaning to tweet bits from it because Trump keeps doing the same things. Exact so same is, things. Like question. the attack like, on the post office. This is right out of that book. That, the, that's, I mean, the, that's the big thing that I'm trying to figure out now is like, how does a neoliberal administration, if it wins, fix all this? Bush, you know, annihilated Back the to EPA. norms. Back like, to norms. Norms. We need norms, norms again, it, Nomi. <laughs> it's, 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 it's incremental. Go back to the Hatch the, Act. Yeah, You exactly. know, start enforcing that again. No, no. Look, we're, we, we are in a, <laughs> this has been going on since I was Three. 1968 is when your sort of backlash, I used to call it the great backlash, began that year, first George Wallace and then Richard Nixon. Nixon gets elected. They have never looked back. The Republican Party reaching out to and winning votes of uh, blue collar voters based largely on the culture war stuff, based on these, you know, uh, class anger expressed in non-economic ways. OK, that's the recipe of the great backlash. This has been going on since 1968. We are more than 50 years into it, and the Democratic Party still can't figure out what to do about it. Right. I mean, these guys used to be the dominant party in our society. Nobody. I'm old enough that I can remember that, you know, when the Democrats were the natural party of government in this country. Because why? Because there's more blue collar workers than there are, <laughs> you know, rich people. And so they were, you know, naturally the majority, the dominant party. And they cannot figure out what to do about it. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you, Nomi, they better figure it out now. Let's say Biden wins this November. I sure hope he does. He's going to have four years to figure out how to put this thing in reverse there, because there's going to be another Trump coming right down the line just every four years the republicans ratchet up this ba but, great backlash you know uh, upside really, down attack is it really possible i mean you, we, we have the largest generation in history the millennials versus baby boomers you know 
produce millennials, that's why it's the largest, is so left-leaning. And Zoomers are so left-leaning. Like, what is the next for... I'm not saying that the right wing won't exist. I'm not saying that they're trying to recruit, like, this kid who shot... Uh, shot protesters in the bag. This guy was, you know, I'm sure there are delusional people out there, but is there really a voting base for well, the Republicans? Well, no, you're, you're, you're letting, you're, you're forgetting about one thing, which is people moving, people changing sides. Uh, I myself was a, a young Republican when I was, when I was little and, uh, I, you know, and uh, I, you know, because I came to political consciousness in like 1980, you know, the hostage crisis, Jimmy Carter. I remember the Malays speech. I, I actually thought Jimmy Carter was a great man until Ronald Reagan came along. And then I, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I outgrew that. But I, I've discovered that uh, I'm kind of unusual moving from right to left, that that's kind of a strange pattern and usually it goes the other way. And I was just thinking about this this morning, all the guys that I knew when I was starting out doing the baffler magazine who have gone over to the right uh and they get they get bitter uh they get disgusted it's it's very easy to get um disillusioned with the democratic party and also with the the broader sort of left in this country and uh it happens all the time and i i wouldn't just because your friends are on the left now doesn't mean they're going to remain a monolithic block forever uh, I mean, look, look at what ha they, there's these huge transitions in American life. You look at the 30s when all of these conservative people were radicalized, basically. Yeah. Uh, or you look at the 1960s where all of these, uh, you know, uh, blue collar people who were enjoying the fruits of what organized labor had got for them and what the New Deal had got for them swung over to 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 the right, you know, to George Wallace and then to Nixon and then to Reagan. I had relatives that did that, you know, that were that were loved Franklin D. Roosevelt. And uh, and voted for Reagan, um, but you, you don't think like with with technology. anyhow. It's hard, it's got to go the other way. That's all I'm saying. It's got to go the other way now. Yeah. It's it's like this cannot go on. It cannot go on. Well, there was also an equal basis. Like there were still there was still a, a a vibrant conservative movement that had, uh, and I think part of it is like folks are just. The, the, the access to information and the ability to organize through oh, online yeah. tools and and inequality, you know, all this stuff coinciding in a way. I mean, it, it, I just don't know what the path moving forward is for conservatives. Maybe it's just. Oh, it's just it's just it's just going to get a angrier and angrier and angrier. The thing is that I actually think that and I hate to say this, Nomi, uh, Trumpism minus the bigotry, if such a thing is possible. And there's an argument as to whether that is possible. But like his economic nationalism, uh, uh, that can succeed. That can succeed. The you know doing everything by tariffs, you know, because he's he's not able to work with Congress and that sort of thing, so he gets his way by using tariffs and and sort of uh, pushing around foreign countries and stuff like that. That can work. And imagine Trumpism in the hands of someone that's not a bigot, or that's not a like a right. really a, a flagrant bigot like he is. That doesn't go go down the list of ethnic groups and insult them all you know he's such a fool it's like politically it's so stupid what he's doing but it's also you know he managed to win i think he managed to win in 2016 despite himself uh, you know this guy trips over his own feet all the time he can't open his mouth and make a a normal English sentence, it always has to curve back around to what a wonderful guy he is. You know? it's, it, it's, it's bizarre. But imagine all this in the hands of someone who, who, is, who, who, you know, who knows how to do politics, who's a good speaker, yeah. who's a canny player, a Ted Cruz, for example. Uh, this is, this is going to continue. It's going to go on and on and on. They're just getting started. Unless the Democrats you know, figure this out, how do you figure it out? Well, uh, I volunteer to come and tell them. <laughs> Pick up the phone, Democrats. Here I come. I'm ready. I don't know if Schumer is going to no, answer. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, but, uh, I, I there has shouldn't... to be an interim. I mean, it might be Harris at that point. Uh, or yeah. Cory Booker, whoever the next generation of, of Demi, God forbid, Pete Buttigieg. But uh, we can be more creative than that, guys. <laughs> Just wait they have to they they have to you know what their grand strategy is now Naomi? you know what it is it's it's um what do they call it the coalition of the ascendant it's basically let's just wait for demographic change because the demographics are going our way slowly yeah. but surely and if we just sit around and wait eventually we'll win well look 
right. you know, that's that's great, except for that you have this other party out there <laughs> that is actively, that's really dynamic and that's right. actually right. trying different things, you know? And so you can't just sit on your butt and wait for the world to come around to you. And that that literally is their strategy. Well, that's why I thought of, 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 of John McCain was... I felt like their strategy was like, oh, he earned it. Let's just give it to him. We know we're not going to win this election. It was his turn. It was his turn. It was his turn. And right, think- right. And the same with Bob Dole in 96. Dole yes. had, Dole had no, not a prayer, but but it was his turn. He'd done such great service for the Republican Party over the years, you know. Yeah, yeah it, it just, to me, it seemed, um, I mean, it is Joe Biden's turn. I think there was a lot of the reason why he had so many people in the race was to show there was this division. Uh, but... I'm concerned because they, they're not, you know, he's not leaving his house. He's not out there. I mean, there are a lot of ways that you could campaign right now because we're in this, like, inter- we've learned a lot about the virus and how we can communicate with each other. And it just doesn't seem like the Democrats have any interest in that at all. And I'm I'm pretty worried looking at the polls, how, how close they are to Clinton in 2016 mm-hmm. and seeing where independents are swinging and you know there's some well look hopefully they hopefully they've they've figured out the mistakes they made in 2016 and they'll they'll remedy that but that said I mean I want to go back to what I said at the start of this which is that Trump has a pretty low bar in his convention which is prove that he's human you know <laughs> show me that's, show that's me that he's a human with. That was the same yeah, thing. and yeah. and if you know he does that uh, by the way you want to know my prediction Sure. What's 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 going to be his, no? What's going to be his issue? What's his issue this time? How is he going to beat Biden? It's not the wall, right? Yeah, it's not that. Bannon uh, wants and he, he to can't really China. he can't really go on about the trade agreements anymore because he's been president for four years. He can boast about how he renegotiated NAFTA, but I think he it's can't. It's 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 violence in the streets. Uh, it is that that's number one, and then number two is going to be mass incarceration. You you heard several references to it already, but it's it's not clear that the speakers who uttered the phrase knew what it meant. It's not clear that they knew. So this is something that I've written about quite a bit since going you know going back quite a ways. It's not clear that they knew what they were talking about. But as this thing unfolds, uh, I mean, and it's completely contradictory, but I, it, that won't stop them. They'll say, on the one hand, law and order. On the other hand, um, you know, blame Joe Biden for, for mass incarceration. And these are completely contradictory. And that won't matter. That's, <laughs> that's, that's is, my is prediction. That, is that also a little bit of a nod to like the Koch brothers too? Uh, well, where do they stand on this stuff? Aren't they? Aren't they? They're, they're, they're pretty. Li- they're, they're pretty anti- libertarian about this. Yeah, yeah. They, so that might be that might be how they eventually figure the issue out. I, I was astonished in a recent article that I wrote. I was astonished to find that one of the Coke foundations actually has all of this stuff on their website about uh, over policing and mass yeah. incarceration. They're actually like. Um, pretty good on that issue, whether to the left of Biden on that issue, yes, uh, that, which is like extraordinary. Um, anyhow, go ahead. I don't ahead. buy it, though. I think that there's another agenda there in terms of uh, rehabilitation facilities. and, and uh, There's always yes. something with these There's guys. always an angle. Um, <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> okay. Yes, there is. That is true. <laughs> Before we wrap up, uh, I, I have to ask you, what do you think the game plan is for – that I should say for the post office in terms of privatization, you think it's going to happen before or after it has to, they have to wait till after they've already, they've, they've, they, they touched a hornet's nest with that one. And what's funny is they've been doing this. That, that's actually in the wrecking crew. They, they've been, this is, they've been waging this war for so long, their war on the post office. It, it disgusts me. That used to be such a, you know, a, a non-issue. It was just a service, but yeah, I mean, the Republicans are, as we all know, are that, you know, extraordinarily cynical, extraordinarily good at politics. Uh, they want what they want and they, they are playing a long game and yeah, the post office, but no, they've, they, 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 they stepped in it with that one. They got to clean off yeah. their shoe and they and wait till after the election to get even with the post office. Oh, it, I'm sorry. When I was a kid, I was a stamp collector. I, I I've always loved the post office and uh, uh, my populists loved the post office. They wanted to have postal post savings banking. banks and yeah. stuff like that. And uh, it, it just, um, it just burns me up when they go after the post office, all those WPA murals, by the way, so the post office here in Bethesda, they sold it. And I went in there. Yeah, it was a beautiful old building from built in the 20s or the 30s. I think it's the 30s because it has a WPA plaque on it. And uh, they sold it. 
And I went in there right before they were closing. And I don't know what they did with the mural, but they had one of those WPA murals on the wall. And I, I offered to buy it. <laughs> I was like, yeah. will you take, you know, $20 for that? And no, I'm, they, they uh, refused to sell it to me, but <laughs> I don't know yeah. what became of it, but they're doing this all over America. Oh, they did so it they, in Manhattan too. Yeah. Yeah. And so in Kansas City, they had the most spectacular post office you've ever seen right across the street from Union Station. And they sold it uh, in, you know, all over the country. They're doing this. It's just, it is yes. catastrophic. And it, it, it uh, anyhow, uh, don't get me started on this. It makes Next me one. so angry. Yeah. After Labor Day, we'll have you. I want, I want a Democratic Party that can at least defend WPA murals. <laughs> you know, come on, guys. Can, can you at least do that? That's like a baseline ask. They can defend you know? Beyonce. They can't defend <laughs> murals. Come on, Thomas. <laughs> kidding. All right. Thank you. It was so great chatting with you. Always a fun conversation. We could, we could just like host a weekend show together. That would, hey, Naomi, like, whenever, well, look, whenever you're, whenever, whenever you want, I'm not doing anything else here in Bethesda, you know. You have all those books to read, Thomas. Come uh, on. I've read all those books. Those are, those are just for show. I, I Here's the, this is the one. This is the one. Here, this guy. Read it's it, Naomi. Book. Read it. Read it. I have it. I'm saying it's your, I hope you read it. Thomas Frank, the <sighs> author of The People No. A brief history People. of anti- No. Oh, oh no. <laughs> no way. Oh, no no way. Mark. No. <laughs> People, no, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, exact. There you go. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm looking forward to having you back on next right. time, too. You got it. Anytime. Right. Take care, Thomas. Bye. Special shout out to the one and only Harvey K, who's in the chat right now. I heard he's causing fights. I'm just getting some updates here that Harvey K has joined the chat. He's fighting with us. He couldn't make it this week. He said no to our request. And now he's in the chat from whatever meeting he's at right now. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, much love to Harvey K. All right, up next, we have Morgan Pakma and Ari Rabenhoff to talk about the Republican Party. Uh, what else? That's what we're going to talk about. No, but really, Trump's Republican Party and the Bush years, too. Uh, we're going to touch on all those different things because it's RNC. It's the time to talk about them. All right, stay tuned. Of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I never put it down. I always get that question. No, there's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's, no fun. That's no fun. I know. I'm getting too old <laughs> for that stuff. I can't do it like I used to. <laughs> Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. Uh, uh, Question from our chat, Rick. Very important question. Uh, They want to know, several people want to know, is there THC? Oh, no, it's in Randy's vape. I thought it was in Rick's vape. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. I've got the vape. Rick's got the vape. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. Is there THC in that? Oh, no. You know something? Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I never put it down. I always get that question. No, there's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's no fun. That's no fun. I know. I'm getting too old for that stuff. All right. Hi, guys. I'm back. Uh, I'm really excited to see what Dorsey shows us tomorrow with uh, the next montage. So someone has to say something crazy on this panel because you too will make it into the montage (laughs) tomorrow. All right. We have a great panel here. Uh, We have the one and only Morgan Pakma making his second appearance. He's a filmmaker, a writer, a journalist. He's the co-director of The Swamp, which just came out on HBO, Slumlord Millionaire, um, and uh, Get Me Roger Stone, of course, which is on Netflix right now. I know him from his great journalism uh, back in New York. We used to nerd out on New York politics, people like Roger Stone, who we never thought would make a, re- you know, come back from the dead, basically. Uh, and next we have Ari Rabenhoft, who is the former deputy campaign manager to Bernie Sanders, former chief of staff to, to Bernie Sanders, former host of The Agenda on Sirius XM. He had the morning show. I had the night show. I took his spot over, I think. And um, and I this is this is something I really want to talk about with him. He's the author of Lies Incorporated, the world of post-truth politics and the Fox effect, how Roger Ailes turned a network, a network into a propaganda machine. Very relevant to today. Thank you guys for joining. Thanks, Nomi. Uh, Ari, I think you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. This is so much fun. <laughs> There you go. There you go. See, if we're in a studio, we can all do this together. 
Um, okay, so crazy RNC uh, propaganda fest, cult fest. I think this is the time for the left to really learn about the Republican tactics and how 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 crazy they might sound to us, but how effective they are at. Uh, basically exciting their base and depressing maybe even some of our base. So I just want to start off. Um, let's let's go to Morgan. Morgan, you know, you did this this documentary on Roger Stone, and uh, Roger Stone has been pardoned. <laughs> so is Roger Stone and and the Nixonian element of politics that that really uh, made him who he is? Is that at play right now in this convention? I think it's gone so far beyond Roger in a sense, because, you know, Nixon, you were still dealing with kernels of truth. And even with Roger, you know, the way that he was able to create these conflagrations of conspiracy and uh, just the mayhem that he's wrought upon the country is to still take it from somewhere. Um, to use something that was factual in nature and sure, twist it around and contorted. But now we are in the era of just the, the big lie. And I know that we talked about, you know, you hear the media talking a lot about gaslighting. And, and of course, that's true. But I feel like that um, undercuts just how um, profound and dangerous um, this type of lie is to the country. And I remember that uh, I remember that during the 2016 cycle, I had met with a Zimbabwean journalist who was saying, um, "In my country, we see Robert Mugabe fall on TV at night, and then the next morning, the paper says, no, Robert Mugabe didn't fall.' Um, and he says, "I'm scared for your country because this is where I see you going." And and that has so resonated with me throughout this convention. And it's resonated with me just broad based across our politics. So, you know, you can hear this retelling of Donald Trump as the hero of the pandemic. But then I also see Andrew Cuomo putting out a book talking about his tremendous leadership during the pandemic when New York has twice the number of deaths uh, um, from coronavirus of any state. And so I'm just I'm not even sure how you come back. From this, if if it's so able, if it's if it's just become strategy that is so broad based to just tell these profound lies, and there is no um, consequence, there is no shame in telling these lies. Like we have reached a whole new level of of Soviet, you know, propaganda where there's no there's no uh, there's a reason why Americans are so cynical because we're being told all the time who you're going to believe, me or your lying eyes. Or the lying media, uh, from Trump's perspective. Ari, you wrote a book about this, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you think that you'd be, number one, did you think you'd be talking about this so many years later after writing that book? I mean, I, I remember, Nomi, like, do you remember, and I don't want to give anything away, but we had that breakfast, like, the morning after the election. I do and remember that very well. After my show, and... It's just like insane to think where the country, like we were kind of both, I think in shock because I think nobody expected it to happen. I, I had to leave the Javits Center at like 2 a.m. and go on air at six. And then we met for breakfast at like 9.30 in Manhattan. And like, I, to think of like, so I started that book, Lies Incorporated in 2012. Um, uh, and it took three years to write. And uh, what was like, what is what I talked about in that book, a, lo a lot of what I talked about is these kind of PR experts recognizing they can create this bifurcation of truth, right? If they can make one segment of the population believe something ludicrous, they can throw enough chaos into the, into the fold to get the kind of results they wanted, i.e., if we can convince just a certain number of people that cigarettes don't cause cancer when scientists in the 50s like it wasn't a 90s thing, knew that cigarettes cause cancer, uh, then we could continue selling this product for decades. And it is important to note that Mike Pence in 2000 questioned whether cigarettes cause cancer. Oh, okay. Publicly. Like I, I just, just the insanity of like, you think of Donald Trump as this like ultimate um, liar, but you, you have Mike Pence who, literally was denying cigarettes caused health problems in 2000. 
And this is not like some like secret thing. No, he literally wrote a column when they were touting last night. He was a radio host and a columnist. I actually went through in 2016 and just for my own edification, got the magazines that he wrote in, which the only copies that exist. First, I went to the Library of Congress and was like, I want these magazines. And the Library of Congress is like, we don't have them. Not kidding. But they are in an archive at the University of Indiana. Called the University of Indiana. They were like, well, they're only available to professors. Literally tracked down a professor oh my God. who pulled all the boxes and sent them to me so I could read them all. What um, magazine was it? It was, it's this, this conservative think tank had a magazine that was, it's like, uh, and look, he, Mike Pence is like, is the personification of the right wing that has persisted for years as part of this kind of alliance between a, a PR industrial complex and the conservative movement that perpetuates lies for profit in a way. And the problem is that you know, in 2012, we think back to the 2012 election. Mitt Romney's campaign, do people remember the unskewed polls? Like they were insisting that everything was wrong and everything that you were seeing was wrong and Mitt Romney was winning and don't believe you're, and then even that like, then he lost, even that like hit of reality didn't impact them. And the problem is that we have created a system over decades, kind of starting with the tobacco industry, which was John Hill, the founder of Hill and Knowlton, kind of mapped that out, going through a whole bunch of issues where truth really didn't matter anymore. And then we created a world where no truth exists, right? Where if I say the sky's blue and you say the sky's green, um, that's the way it is. I, I had a reporter, there was a, I was fighting with a reporter during the election, which was not an unusual circumstance for a like as major a publication as you could get. And I was like, you know, X isn't true. Why are you writing this? And their answer was yes, but X feels X is true. So the audience feels. No, no, the source the felt source X is felt. true. Right. So there, and the audience behind them yes. agrees yeah. that X is true. So we, even though I know with documented evidence, this thing isn't true. I am going to print it and then say there, but, and the problem is we exist in this world where that doesn't, that, where that doesn't help, where fact checks, I, I, you know, there's been a ton of academic study on fact checks. Fact checks actually convince more people that lies are true than they do convince people that truth is true. It's, it, we in this, exist in this very strange universe and we're on the precipice. We are in a dangerous world and it's getting more dangerous because of it. I mean, so much of this, is, is so obvious, I think back to like the McCarthy hearings and eventually into Nixon. Uh, and this is sort of where I think the, the story of Roger Stone is so fascinating and how he has played a role in, I mean, there's, there's, there's like the Fox reality. There is the Bush way of playing with the truth. And then there's this very aggressive form of it in which like the more to the right, the more extreme uh, the misinformation is and the lying is and the alternative facts are, which I think really started in that era, um, the more like reporters start to say, well, so-and-so feels this way because it's moving so far to the right. So, you know, you, Morgan, when you were working on this documentary with Roger Stone, which took you several years, like it was way before Donald Trump and, Rod, you know, was, was, I know he had talked to Donald Trump about running as far back as the 80s, but did he ever talk about the truth? Just, just how facts were to be interpreted. You, you know, it's so fascinating. And, and I was just having my own flashback to uh, the election night in 2016 because I was in Alex Jones's bunker <laughs> with, um, with Alex <laughs> Jones and Roger. Stop. Um, you know, that whole surreal evening to two or three o'clock in the morning, um, which is, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, that's the embodiment of uh, this... I, you know, I, I'm like so hesitant to use all these terms like post-truth era because I feel like it degrades um, the, the, the degree to which our country um, is, is at that precipice that Ari was talking about. Um, you know, Roger, um, way before this even became a term, started calling himself an alternate historian. Uh, and he was writing these books, these accounts of 
LBJ as um, uh, being behind the Kennedy assassination. That's actually how Roger and Alex Jones met. They met at the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy Association in Dealey Plaza. Roger was there because he had built this brand around um, pointing the finger at LBJ and, and Alex was there. It was in his, his wheelhouse in Texas and uh, it fed into the conspiracy theories that he, you know, that he, he peddles. And then Roger wrote a book, kind of this, this re-envisioning of what the Nixon era was. And he's written a whole bunch of these books. And he calls himself an alternative historian. What could be a more cynical term? Right, the alternative historian, you know, that's like maybe um, these these uh, these books of fiction where they re envision who won the World War II, but like the, there's no there's no alternate history, right? And that was just so indicative of how ahead of the curve Roger was in understanding how these like fake news outlets or at least platforms where you could reach a lot of people could so muddy the water. And this is exactly what Ari was talking about, right? So if you have this, this, uh, this idea in every single piece of journalism that you have to have some sort of moral equivalency or the other side has to be represented, um, then it, of course, why not just put out the most outrageous um, lies possible because those will make it into those pieces that are that the public is trying to discern between these two poles, what is the truth? And rather than the media drawing us to these conclusions about the, the gray areas of our politics, the immense complication of all these issues, um, the, the whole media thrives on creating conflict, right? So why not just put the most ridiculously polar opposite positions and say, oh, they're in a debate uh, when there is no such thing as a debate because one is absolutely a lie and the other one is pushed to the extremes by the, the desire to fend off this lie. Um, and so um, this, this is something that um, I don't even think that Roger would have ever thought how successful he could be. But he was a, an early, um, he saw what Steve Bannon was doing. Obviously, Steve Bannon understood from Andrew Breitbart that this was an extraordinary way to move the nation. And the, the Bannons and, and Roger and Alex Jones, they all found each other. And in a lot of ways, they just kept pushing the to the limits what would possibly be tolerable and, and tolerated by our society and our media. And, and it, it appears that we have an unlimited threshold for this. And so we've been pushed to the extremes in a way that it was greater than they could have ever imagined. It's, it's worse than an unlimited threshold. It's almost a desire for it. There's been this like cycle with the New York Times. It happened uh, in the early Obama years. It happened at the beginning of Trump where they'll be like, we miss this rise of conservative lies. We have to cover them better, right? They did it. We missed Glenn Beck. We have to cover him more seriously. There was literally a stage in 2009, 2010 where they were saying that as Glenn Beck is having on his show all of these alternative historians who are casting very weird notions about American history, world history, literally people who are writing fake history books on his show uh, in, in those stages. And the problem is, the problem is the right, the mainstream right kind of cheered it on. They, lo they loved it. Right. They, they were like, it's it's in 2004 when sorry 1994 when Republicans took back the House of Representatives they had Rush Limbaugh come to their uh, meeting, right? And he was kind of a new thing. Remember he didn't go on air until '88, so he was it showed like six years old at that point. Um, sorry, he didn't go national until '88. Um, in in the case of of once 2009 happened, even main pe people who were formerly kind of mainstream Republicans like the Tea Party, they like the outrage, they cheered it on, they kind of invited it into their midst. And then now uh, it's kind of a bunch of these Lincoln Project people are kind of like, oh my God, I'm so shocked. Oh, I'm in vapors because of what these people are doing. But it is the, it is the direct result of them kind of encouraging us in their tent. And the problem is now there's an outrage imbalance, right? Where the left kind of doesn't have the same outrage vehicles as the right. And the right, uh, like Spinal Tap, has their outrage meters always turned up to 11. Right. So, 
Sorry, Nomi. You no, know, and, and and that's that's interesting because you sort of touched on this. While you have the 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 far right, the Glenn Beck, well, he ended up being mainstream, but well, you have the Alex Jones and the Steve Bannons and the Andrew Breitbarts. You still had Fox News, which is just as batshit cuckoo. Um, and these two, and, and they're seen as the mainstream by the far right, even though they they work together, they appear on mm-hmm. shows together. Um, when you were covering Fox News, yeah. Uh, and I've, I think both of you know, I've been on Fox News many, 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 many times. And there's a real strategy there. Like every inch of the place under Roger Ailes, every des- set design, he watched every show. He would yell at makeup if he found out that the, 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 the woman on air had her hair back, if she was wearing big earrings. Every little thing was thought about in yes. terms of how it moved an audience. So Ari, like... What could the what could we as a progressives learn from that? Because this is ultimately like what you just touched on us. We don't have a vehicle. We don't have a vehicle, and we also don't have a strategy. Yeah, and and the the problem is they have a mainstream entity that has moved further and further right. Like remember in two thousand eight, Fox News prime time had Hannity and Combs, even though you know Hannity and liberal to be weak liberal to be named later. Um, you had kind of O'Reilly and Greta Van Susteren, who's kind of like all over the place, right? Uh. <laughs> yeah, but not she's not a movement conservative. Over the next year, it transitioned to a far right primetime lineup, which has only gotten it's actually gotten further and further. And progressives, look, our the 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 liberal network in massive air quotes, MSNBC, its morning shows hosted by a Republican, its midday shows are hosted by Bush administration officials, you know. Um, you know, that, that would never play. And we don't look, we don't have, um, we don't have kind of mainstream media and like the truth about media bias. And I think this is, you know, the right will always say the media is biased towards liberals. And like the truth, the truth is most reporters I encountered are kind of nice liberals, meaning they're kind of pro-choice when you talk to them, they're kind of, they're, they're socially liberal, but they're not progressive. They're not Democrats, they're not thing. And they get so careful about being that because their natural inclinations because of socioeconomic class and class and other issues is to kind of be like that, like pro-choice, pro-gay marriage kind of uh, liberal, right? They get so cautious, they try to swing the other way and be kind of, it enables the right to work the refs at mainstream publications far more effectively than the left can because these, because a lot of reporters are scared about these sympathies kind of seeping into their coverage. And like, it's a real question because the truth is, look, Roger Ailes, sorry, Rupert Murdoch bankrolled Fox News with a billion dollars. Rupert Murdoch has lost hundreds of millions of dollars in the New York Post. Rupert Rupert Murdoch like is a significant part of the story because if you add it up, while Fox News has become immensely profitable, he probably spent on order of 1.5 to $2 billion on right-wing media in this country. And there is nobody in the progressive space who's ever even thought about spending as close to that. Not uh, Al Gore. (laughs) I I mean, but I'm wary about the antidote being creating progressive propaganda. Uh, and I think true. that this is this is where our, this is the inherent imbalance in the system, right? And it, it also shows the weakness of the media because um, I would say that reporters had this, um, I think, halcyon view of bias-free journalism, which is just absolutely ridiculous because we're human beings, so we are all permeated with bias and this idea that you could tell something just from you know, this, this distance, and you could communicate information in a passionless way. Um, that is almost, um, in a lot of times, that's journalistic malpractice, mm-hmm. as we've seen, right? Because if you are just enabling these, uh, the lies and the truth to have equal footing, then you are undermining the very truth that you're supposed to be communicating to your audience. But I think that the, the media got tangled up in this construct this idea that we are supposed to be uh, outside of the fray, that we are not supposed to have opinions of our own, that we are not supposed to have thoughts of our own. Like, that is that is not necessarily the model that the media is even supposed to have. The media is supposed to speak truth to power. Um, and so, 
And that is oftentimes taking a very powerful stand. A lot of the great journalists of the 20th century were people who were unabashed in putting forward their opinions. And that didn't make them any more, uh, any less scrupulous or um, incisive reporters. Um, but because they were put themselves in this box of having no bias, that enabled them to be so susceptible to this wave of propaganda, which is, I think, what also was Ari was talking about, right? So if you have this tidal wave of lies come at you all the time, and you're like, I just want to be above the fray, you are ill-equipped to deal with the dynamics at play there. And I think we've seen the media try to recalibrate over the Trump era and find some sort of soul that, um, that could speak the truth and be like, no, actually, this is just a lie. Um, and, but then I see time after time, the, the, whole, the whole media, um, the stories that they prioritize. Like, I can't tell you how many articles I read, like, um, oh, uh, the Trump campaign says actually things are going well for the Trump campaign. It's like, why is that even a story? Oh, let me just give you 600 words so you can just give me your unabashed spin. And then I'm gonna put that out there and be like, well, actually see the Trump campaign says things are going well. Um, you know, and I feel like that is such a, a flawed model. And, um, and I think that this idea that we need to have some sort of counter propaganda that flies in the face of progressive values, right? If we are supposed to, you know, I, I feel like I want to have my views challenged so that I can come to an understanding that is true, that is greater than my own ideology. And, and that is what makes us so weak in, uh, in comparison to this um, Tyrannosaurus of, of propaganda and lies. It's, it's interesting because I think in the last few weeks we've seen a lot of stories get published that were just like allegations. And I, I sit there and, you know, we've all worked in the media in different ways. And I, I wonder, I'm like, well, this is an allegation against a congressional candidate, but there's no there there. There's no, number one, no specific. It's a feeling. And these are just reporting standards that wouldn't fly uh, if we didn't have this system, because they have to be fact-checked, you have to be sourced, you have to... There's lots of different aspects of journalism that you learn when you're a journalist. But I think the underlying point here is, while you have this rising right-wing uh, media space that is, is, is tapping into the underbelly of this country and making it mainstream, simultaneously in the last 10 years, you've had a crisis in journalism where uh, we don't have muckrakers like we did in the progressive era, uh, we investigative reporting has been slashed almost entirely. State house reporting is like an ounce of what it was before. I think seventy or eighty percent of state house reporters um, are, are newspapers have been shuttered all over this country. Thousands, literally thousands. And then these the the media companies are bought up by hedge funds. So there's a real financial aspect to this too in keeping reporters from being able to do their job, whether it's investigating um, a company's. Uh, you know whether they're 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 but they're hurting their workers, um, they're violating the law, or obviously politicians who uh, will get away with with bad things at the local level, and then sometimes it rises up. So, um, really interesting conversation. Love to have you guys back on. I really appreciate your time. Uh, final thoughts <laughs> on this convention. How do you think Trump's speech will be interpreted in the press tomorrow? Ari, go first. Um, I don't know. The, the, the previews are all he's just going to rip Biden. And I'm sure it will it will be a whole bunch of spin. Like the convention has been all this like, this is the Donald Trump you, you've never seen. Right. This is he's such a nice and thoughtful and sweet guy. And when they've been positive and now he's going to come out and like. Be a, be his normal self. And I, I, I'm intrigued to see what people what people say. Morgan. I thought that his convention speech in 2016 might have been his most effective speech ever. It articulated a message that could have been um, a very different Trump presidency. Of course, it was just clearly written for him because we've never seen a reflection of that. But it really doesn't matter what he says tonight. Um, you know, these are uh, carefully produced infomercials and there is no sort of message discipline in the Trump campaign. He will say something completely disparate tomorrow. And I, I mean, I think the best thing to do probably is just to ignore it. 
Hopefully uh, others will be ignoring it too. All right, Morgan Pakma, Ari Ravenhoff, thank you for joining today. Uh, hope to see you again soon. Be well, stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Domi. Thank you, Domi. All right, guys, a couple of shout outs on our super chat. We want to give love, send love to Darren Alevi and S. Blackmare. Oh, is so showing us love. Thank you, guys. Uh, tomorrow, we have a great show. We're going to be talking about the future, right? So what what do we do after this convention? How do we as a movement, uh, no matter who wins, uh, Democrat or Republican, Biden or Trump, how do we as a movement uh, stay intact, focus on what's important? Um, we're going to be talking to... Josh McCon Russell, who is one of uh, a good friend, and he used to appear on Michael Brooks' show, good friend of Michael Brooks. We're going to talk about the soul of the movement, the soul of organizing, and we're also speaking to Greg Palast, who uh, has covered a lot on stolen elections because we have to be aware of what could potentially come. Postal service, no postal service, voter suppression, not really sure all the different aspects, but we, we do know after this week's reporting that um, Donald Trump is really – trying to keep the vote, uh, the excitement on the left down and uh, gin up his support in whatever way he can. So definitely want to stay tuned. Click like, subscribe down there. And if you're not already, uh, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show for as low as $5 a month. I will see you guys tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. There's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's, no fun. That's no fun. I know. I'm getting too old <laughs> for that stuff. I can't do it like I used to. Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping, you know that, Nomi. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. Always yeah. got the vape. That's what I thought. Always yeah. got the vape. That's what I thought. A, a question from our chat, Rick. Very important question. Uh, they want to know, several people want to know, is there THC? Oh, no, it's in Randy's vape. I thought it was in Rick's vape. I'm confused. Who's got the vape? Rick's got the vape. I've got the vape. Rick's got the vape. Always got the vape. That's what I thought. Is there THC in that? Oh, no. You know something? (laughs) Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping. You know that, Nomi. I never put it down. I always get that question. No, there's nothing good in there. It's just uh, nicotine. That's no fun. I know. know. I'm getting too old (laughs) for that stuff. I can't do it like I used to. Every time I do one of these, and I'm always vaping.